we'll make it work. Come on in. Come on in. Come on closer, closer. Closer, closer. Closer. You gotta see Penn back there. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't okay, know how right. for long. So we're at the Dallas Museum of Art today and a couple weeks ago we had a meetup and we had a full 30 people attend and this is my friend Sue Canterbury who is the curator of American Art at the Dallas Museum of Art and a longtime friend of mine. We've worked together quite a bit in the past yes. and she was gracious enough to give us a tour on the meetup but for those of you who weren't able to come and would like to see what the show's all about, we're going to take a look at Irving Penn and get a tour from the curator herself. So thank you very much Sue. You're most welcome. As Irving Penn was heading through the American South on his way to Mexico, you see coming forward not only the influence of Walker Evans and some of the shots he did of the people that he encountered along the way, but you also see that continuing thread of surrealism. Um, it starts from the beginning, the influence of Eugene Naget in his earliest works, and uh, keeps falling forward. It's a thread that'll run throughout his career, sometimes below the surface and sometimes more obvious. This particular one, uh, you know, it, it's quite different from the other things that we've seen uh, before it. And when I look at it, I see it as basically a very prescient type of photograph. If you were to imagine this in color, you can see how it would fit absolutely perfectly within his color work of like the 70s and 80s. This was, more, you know, it struck Penn uh, more deeply in 1983 than it did in a way in 1942. And so essentially he goes back, pulls this picture forward and prints it in 1983. And that's something else about Penn too. Uh, aside from changing processes, he would revisit pictures and decide, you know, that would, that would be a much better picture in platinum uh, than a gelatin silver print. And so he would change it up. And also, again, in something such as this, revisiting his work and realizing that's a really great picture and it appealed to him in a stronger or a different way decades later. Of course, Irving Penn's known for his fashion photography. That's what most people know him for. And we have really wonderful examples here um, of what he accomplished in early photography. In terms of fashion photography at that moment in time, it was a very different thing from this. It was a tableau vivant. You had to set up a scene to create an occasion for the dresses or the outfit that was being modeled. Penn hated that. He decided, you know, it's too much work. And he also felt that it really distracted from the clothes. And so he went to a very bare, stripped down approach, very plain backgrounds. And the result was you really saw the model and you really saw the clothes. And this is something that designers love because there was nothing to distract the eye away from their designs. Um, and also you'll see the heavy emphasis on silhouette in these pictures. Something that's very key about Penn, that sort of sense, that reliance on form and line. Uh, so that predominates really throughout his work. And in 1949 and 50, he embarked on a series of nudes. It marks the first time in his career where he would start experimentation in the dark room and in a very big way. Uh, these nudes, basically he hired 15 models, artist models, so not the usual rail thin fashion model. The length of exposure was exceedingly long. Um, I'm not sure exactly how long, but it was very long to the point that everything would be blacked out. Well, when he went to process them, he passed them through a fairy cyanide solution, which bleached them out. And so basically it would strip out a lot of the darkness, but those areas that had been absolute darkest would now have more of a mid-tone, and the lightest areas were shockingly pale and ghostly. The effect that you look at here is really, he's creating a very three-dimensional, almost sculptural thing. And when you look at the surface of the skin here, it really looks like marble or alabaster. And this one, the lines in it almost, really they look like drawing. And further down, this is a particular interesting one done in much darker tones here. She has the appearance of almost like bronze sculpture. In 67, 1967, he went to the New York Public Library and started to do research. And he came across a recipe for platinum printing. Directly behind me, you see three 
pictures of cigarettes. And those are from a series that was Penn's first series intended fully to be done in the platinum process. He had experimented with reprinting some of his older things, such as one of those nudes uh, from 1949. He'd, he'd experimented with it, but this was the first series, the cigarettes, that was to be shot totally with platinum in mind. And on the two side walls in this gallery, you have pictures from two other series. Um, one is going to be the street materials uh, or street trash and another one called Underfoot, the two smaller photos on either side uh, from his Underfoot series. Now, the cigarettes as well as the street trash, Penn would send his assistants out into the street to bring things back to the studio. And one assistant recounted to him years later how he would bring back things that he thought were really interesting. And Penn said, I don't want you to bring me things that are interesting. I want you to bring me things that can be made interesting through photography. And at a period of time when most photographers, photographers could never afford to do color photography, Penn basically had the resources of Vogue at his hands and he learned how to do color photography on Vogue's dime. And a really great example on the processing side is uh, a work here he did for L'Oreal and just simply called Mouth done in 1986, and this is a dye transfer print, which means that each of these colors had to be run separately. Now, how do you run a piece of photographic paper through multiple uh, you know, stages of development? Because we have eight colors of lipstick here, okay? And so basically what Penn came up with, he created a metal sheet usually aluminum, you know, the same size, more or less, as the photograph, and he would glue the photograph on. Well, for him to get that perfect so there would be no buckling in the paper from all the exposure to the liquids, he worked with DuPont, and DuPont came up with a glue that would, the adhesion would hold the paper through all of the stages of processing, but when it came time to remove it from the uh, metal support, the glue would release. One of the things that you notice in this gallery are four prints that are very wide format. Um, they're all of these four long ones, the bones there, these um, ingots of steel, as well as this wonderful still life of spilt milk, and a, another one to the far right there. He basically reached way back to bring uh, a very old camera forward to suit his purposes. Um, a Fulmer and Schwein banquet view camera, which would have been manufactured in, in around 1910 or so. The thing that he liked about it was it had a 12 by 20 format. And so what that meant, he did not have to put it through the enlarger. It was like a direct contact print. And as a result, you have this really great resolution and this wonderful detail that comes up in each of these photographs. In the 1990s, Irving Penn became really fascinated with the idea of movement in photography. It came across in some of his fashion shoots, but he also did these private projects again, where he would um, basically create essentially almost like a multiple exposure. And he called these for, I think, lack of a better phrase, moving light. And how he would do this, he had a Fresnel light that would flash and a subject such as this skull was placed on the equivalent of a Lazy Susan. And so you had an assistant turning the, the Lazy Susan. Uh, and so at each point where this Fresnel light would go off, he would click the camera and you got these multiple exposures in the sense that you almost feel like you're getting a hologram that's turning. Um, he also did it with himself. Uh, in terms of, I don't know if he just stood there and just turned <laughs> back and forth, but he creates you know, multiple exposures of himself you know, from side to center, just like the skull. The process for this whole thing, or I guess the, 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 the process of taking the picture was a very complex one, aside from that Fresnel light, the Lazy Susan, et cetera. The camera that he used, again, the Fulmer and Schwing Banquet View camera, which he had you know, first brought forward in 1979 for his still lifes. Now, it's a bellows camera, 
has one bellows and a slide that you can slide the bellows out on. To get what he wanted, Penn added a second bellows. Okay, if you add a second bellows, suddenly that little track for the original camera doesn't reach far enough. So he took the tracks off of a rolling machine and added them to the camera so the two bellows could fully extend. The other issue that would arise um, was one of heat within the bellows. In order for him to reduce the heat and get air exchange, but no light in, he added a, a large black tube to the bottom of one of the bellows and it curled down around. So air could get in and out, but the light could not. So he was really brilliant in that way, how he could you know, not only think outside of the box on the other side of the camera, but what he did to the cameras and then what he would do in the dark room as well. So I hope you guys have enjoyed this and I want to say thank you once again to the Dallas Museum of Art and to Sue Canterbury for allowing me to collaborate with them now on over the course of several videos that we've done around this exhibition. Most of you guys know I used to work for the Dallas Museum of Art and I was there for about seven years and so it obviously has a big place in my life and I remember going there when I was a kid so to be able to collaborate with them on this exhibition has been a complete joy. The exhibition as you can see is absolutely fabulous. A couple weeks ago I did a meetup and we had 30 people show up and most people were from in and around the Dallas area um, but we did have some people come a very long way. Uh, Jen came all the way down from Calgary, Art came from Oregon and John came up from Houston and so I was really honored that people wanted to do this and we had a wonderful time hanging out and talking photography. Um, Sue gave an hour-long tour which was really cool and really special and I want to thank Sue for that. Um, Sue's a friend of mine, I just asked her to do it, she didn't have to do it um, but she wanted to and she enjoys what she does and she likes to share with with people who are interested in the exhibition and so um, it was amazing it was a lot of fun and we talked for about 30 minutes today and I edited that down for this video to keep it reasonable um, but the exhibition is very deep as was Irving Penn and there's about 160 some odd images in the show if you're in and around the Dallas area I highly recommend you see it it is on view through most of the summer it closes on August 14th 2016 and it is an amazing show Show. And once again, thanks to Sue and thanks to the Dallas Museum of Art for allowing me to collaborate with them on this. And it has been a lot of fun and we have a bunch of videos and I'll put links below in the show notes if you have not seen those. And uh, anyway, if you guys enjoyed this video, please remember to like it and share it with your friends. And as always, subscribe to The Art of Photography so you'll always be up to date on all the crazy stuff that I do here. And until the next video, I'll see you then. Later.